Um, great. Uh, well, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where everybody is today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Allison Lawrence. I'm the Senior Manager for U.S. Fish and Ocean Policy at Environmental Defense Fund. Lee Habegger, the Executive Director for Seafood Harvesters of America, unfortunately couldn't join us today. You see her picture on the Zoom screen, but that is Sydney from Seafood Harvesters helping us on the tech side. Um, but Lee and I have been working on these webinars together for the last couple of months. Um, this is the third webinar in our four-part series on climate change and fisheries. Dr. Anna Mercer, Scott Goodman, and Corey Lesher. Uh, first up will be Dr. Anna Mercer. She is the Chief of the Cooperative Research Branch at the Northeast Fishery Science Center, as well as the Director of the Northeast Fishery Science Center's Narragansett Lab in Narragansett, Rhode Island. Throughout her career, Dr. Mercer has worked to develop research projects that address the questions and concerns of fishermen and the scientific community, including collection of high-resolution fishery data, oceanographic monitoring, habitat mapping, fishing gear development, and marketing of utilized of underutilized seafood species. Dr. Mercer has spent hundreds of days on fishing vessels, collecting data and learning from the men and women who harvest our seafood. She has also been at the forefront of applying collaboratively collected data to the assessment and management of fisheries resources. And the next step we'll hear from Scott Goodman. Scott is the executive director of the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation and the president of Natural Resources Consultants, Inc. in Seattle, Washington. Scott has over 25 years of experience working on fisheries research projects with a strong focus on Bering Sea crab. He has helped Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation work through complicated crab research and management issues, collaborating with scientists, academics, and industry stakeholders. Currently, Scott also serves as an advisor to the Aleutians King Crab Research Foundation. He is a member of the Executive Committee for the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network, sits on the Climate Change Task Force for the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, and he is also a member of the Certified Seafood Collaborative, Collaborative representing Alaska's responsible fisheries management for the sustainable certification of several Alaska crab stocks. Thank you very much for giving us some of your time today, Scott. You're a busy man. <laughs> um, and last but not least, we'll also hear from Corey Lesher. Corey's based out of Anchorage, Alaska. He's a science advisor and policy analyst for the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers. Corey has worked for over a decade as a fisheries biologist and scientific researcher. He's had the opportunity to work on the back deck of over 100 fishing vessels of different sectors, from trial vessels and fixed gear to saners and gill netters. With a passion for the ocean and understanding of industry needs, Corey endeavors to collaborate with fishermen, scientists, and fishery managers alike to sustainably manage the ocean's resources. I think we have a great program coming through all today. Um, after the presentations, we'll have time for Q&A and discussions, but just a couple of housekeeping things before we start. Um, we are recording this webinar today, but we're only going to be recording the presentation portion of the webinar. So um, if you want to ask any questions, but you don't want your question recorded, please wait until the Q&A time. At that time, we'll have shut off the recording. And just note, if you do ask a question during the presentations, um, that will be recorded. Um, the recording will be posted on Seafood Harvester's YouTube channel. So folks will be able to access the presentation later. Lee's been posting them within the next day or so. And feel free to share the webinar with whoever you think might be interested in your networks. Um, you may have noted you are all muted and off camera, and there's also no chat function. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation or during the Q&A, you have two options. First, there's the raise your hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you raise your hand, I or Sydney will be able to unmute you, and you can come off camera at that time if you'd like. Um, or you can also put questions in the Q&A box that's also at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. Um, I do just ask, ideally, we'll try to keep any substantive questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar, but if you do have any clarifying questions or something brief, um, please let us know during the presentations and uh, we could address it then. 
So I think that's it for now. I'll turn it over to Anna. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm hoping you can enable my screen sharing. Otherwise, you have my presentation to share it for me. Um, so it's disabled for me. So um, I'll give yes. you a minute. Sydney, are you see if that able? Works. Yeah, let's see if that works. I just added, you should be able to use it now. There you go. I believe so. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Excellent. Um, thank you. Glad the technology worked out. And thank you for the invitation to present today. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Allison um, and Lee, who is here with us in spirit, I guess. <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know me, before I dive in to the presentation, Allison gave a kind of a brief overview of who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, but to give you a little bit more uh, information about kind of where I sit, um, I currently work for the Northeast Fishery Science Center um, out of our Narragansett lab in Rhode Island. Um, I've been in this position for about four years. Um, and today I'll walk you through several of the research programs that um, I work with our team to execute um, over time. Um, but prior to coming in, into this position at NOAA, I was the director of a nonprofit organization called the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, where I work with the Board of Fishermen to really develop new research ideas and implement those ideas um, and apply those in the science and management, fishery science and management process. Um, so I've been kind of working in this cooperative research space for about 15 years now. Um, and really, um, even though I spent many years in school, um, I've learned just about as much on the decks of vessels and on the docks and in the ports. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today and share some of what we're doing um, to engage folks who are on the water and um, in the docks and the research that we do. So before we dive in, I thought it would be helpful um, to just set the stage here so we're all on the same page about what we're talking about today. We've already heard the term cooperative research several times, um, but this type of research has many different names. Um, some people call it science and research industry collaboration. Some people call it collaborative research. Some people call it cooperative research. There are many, many names for this. So just to set the stage for today, um, the definition for cooperative research, at least that I'll be using in my talk, is research that's conducted in partnership um, between the fishing industry and the science community. And that takes many different forms, which I will talk through today, as well as Corey and Scott will give examples um, with really the intent of this work um, being to improve our understanding of our ocean ecosystems and support sustainable fisheries management. Um, really the crux of cooperative research as I see it, and I think Scott and Corey can speak to this as well, um, is, is trust. Um, and that's something here in the Northeast that doesn't always come naturally, <laughs> uh, especially between the science community um, and fishing industry. Um, but that is really the core of every cooperative research project that I'll talk about today. Um, and there are many different ways that we can collaborate, as you can see in this um, infographic. Um, you, we can do surveys together. We can work to advance fishing gear to be more effective. We can monitor the ocean to understand, for example, um, our changing ocean climate. We can collect biological samples. We can tag fish. And ultimately, we can learn from each other. And I think this exchange of knowledge um, between the fishing industry and science community, again, is one of those core components of cooperative research trust and knowledge exchange. Um, and, then, and then ultimately, in my perspective, the way that cooperative research is successful is if we're able to produce scientific results and products um, that can be applied um, in fisheries management, ocean, ocean use planning, or in other ways. Um, so just to highlight one more thing here in terms of what cooperative research is, is um, again, from my perspective, cooperative research is not just calling a fisherman and saying, hey, can we use your boat for this work? but it's really working with fishermen in every step of the scientific process from developing your hypotheses, prioritizing your research, um, collecting the data, which you can see up in the top left here, whether that's scientists on board or just fishermen collecting those data themselves independently, um, to analyzing those data and applying them in our stock and ecosystem assessments, um, to applying those data in the management process and ultimately in adopting some of the results or fishing practices um, while actively fishing. And so there are, um, there's a place for cooperative research in every step of the scientific process. Um, and I'll try to flag that through each of the examples that I give today. Um, there are so many examples of cooperative research. I have 20 minutes with you today. I certainly cannot cover um, all, of, all of these. This is just scratching uh, the surface. 
I'll provide, I think I have five examples here of you today, all of different types and different categories, just to give you a sense of um, the different ways that we're engaging with industry. Um, and the last thing I'd say kind of on the diversity of research is that often our best ideas, our research ideas, um, are coming directly from the industry themselves. Um, that was especially my experience when I was at the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, and it's an area that um, I'm certainly trying to move uh, NOAA Fisheries in my new role here, newer role here. So let's dive in. Um, the first example I have for you in cooperative research really being run here at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is in our survey. Um, so on the West Coast, it's much more standard for industry vessels to be used for our fishery surveys. That is not the case um, here in the Northeast. The vast majority of our fishery surveys are operated on NOAA ships or on chartered research vessels. Um, however, there is a real critical role um, for industry in helping us design our surveys and in helping us execute our surveys, especially um, as our surveys are, are under um, some additional stress from, from um, new impacts such as offshore wind. The example that I wanted to give today of uh, a survey that is, um, was developed and is executed in collaboration with the fishing community is our Gulf of Maine bottom longline survey. Um, so a group of industry member, members came um, to the forefront in about 2010, expressing concern that our other fisheries surveys were not capturing species that are associated um, with, with structured habitat, which is indeed the case, um, because largely our surveys are mobile gear and they're not able to get into rocky bottom. And so in response to that, um, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and the Cooperative Research Branch, which is who I work with, um, developed a new survey um, using long line gear that specifically focused on the areas in the Gulf of Maine um, that are rocky habitat. So we use the same depth strata um, as many of our other fishery independent surveys, but we further substratify, um, which you can see in the top map there, by bottom type. So the yellow that you see there um, is rough bottom, and the kind of greenish color that you see there is smooth bottom. And so we select our stations um, based upon um, the habitat type in addition to the depth. Um, our industry partners on this survey um, have been consistent throughout the entirety of the survey, which started in 2014. Um, it's, uh, we have the fishing vessel, the Mary Elizabeth, um, which is captained by Eric Hess, and I'm uh, oh, sorry, it's captained by Phil Lynch, and the fishing vessel, the Tenacious Sioux, which is captained by Eric Hess. Um, they were really critical in designing this survey and of course in executing our survey. The Gulf of Maine Bottom Longline Survey uh, was the only fishery survey in the Northeast to run during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that in large part was because of the flexibility and adaptability of our, our industry partners um, in figuring out a way to get it done, um, which I think many people on this call can agree that something uh, uh, that fishermen are very good at figuring out how to get it done. Um, so the way we approach this survey, we have 45 random stratified stations in the spring and in the fall. Um, of course, just like any survey, we go to those surveys and we deploy our long line gear. We fish a thousand hooks on a not one nautical mile long line. Um, and we also collect a variety of other ecosystem information at each of those stations. Habitat classification using video um, drop cameras, current measurements, bottom temperature, depth information, a whole suite of information. Um, ultimately, um, what we have are time series. We have time series of how many fish um, and of what biomass are in what areas over time. We're in year 10 of this survey, so it's really becoming a mature survey um, and have had success just in the last few years of applying the Gulf of Maine bottom long line survey data as indices of abundance in our stock assessments. Um, we've had the most success in this in some of our groundfish species as well as our data poor species. Um, where we're informing both the assessments, both through indices of abundance, as well as through collection and application of biological data, um, particularly life history. Um, another key piece of this as it relates to climate is that we, the Gulf of Maine is one of the most uh, rapidly warming areas in the globe. It's warming seven times faster than anywhere else in, uh, in the world. Um, and so really monitoring the environment in addition to the fish in this area is really critical. And so we're just starting to kind of dig deeper into the environmental data that we're collecting through the survey and understanding how that's impacting the shifts that we're seeing in the fish populations and in the fisheries. All right, moving on to our next category um, of examples I wanted to provide is kind of fishery statistics or fishery dynamics. Um, really understanding how fisheries work. 
Um, and for those of us who, who aren't working on boats every day, and that is not our living, um, I think we all can recognize that, that fishermen in the fishing industry, the one, you're the ones who know this information. Um, and so this is where my group devotes a lot of time and attention is working with industry to better understand fishery dynamics. And the example that I'll give today is called the Study Fleet. Um, this program was initiated in about 2006, really as a way to fill data gaps, um, particularly collecting higher resolution information um, on catch and effort in the environment while fishing. So again, this is different than a survey in that we're providing the fishing fleet with tools to collect detailed information while they're fishing. Um, currently, we have 56 vessels from Maine down to North Carolina participating uh, in the study fleet, where each captain is provided with um, specialized software and a Bluetooth uh, temperature sensor on their gear um, that allows them to collect um, detailed information on the species and amounts they're catching in each gear haul, um, and then providing to that all that information to us wirelessly. So you can broaden the or that would be provided to enter his catch data, catch and effort data. Um, and you can see the map here on the bottom, right, that shows the distribution of the data that we have from the study fleet, ranging from the southern Gulf of Maine down to the mid-Atlantic. Um, ultimately, these data have been used in multiple ways, and one of the primary ways that we're, we're applying them is by developing catch per unit effort indices for stock assessment. So it's um, being more and, and more recognized that often our surveys, which are conducted only once or twice a year or less than that, are not capturing really what's going on in such a rapidly changing environment. And that this type of information from the fisheries is really critical for understanding what's going on with these stocks um, that we have to assess. So we've been devoting a lot of time and analytical power to developing catch clean effort indices from um, the study fleet data. We've also been able to use this information to really understand some of uh, the impacts of um, a changing ocean climate on species distributions as well as fishery dynamics, largely using thermal habitat models. We've done this for both butterfish and for mackerel, and that information has been integrated in both of those stock assessments. And then finally, something I'll talk about in a little bit is we've been um, starting to apply the data collected through study fleet um, to understand the impact of offshore wind on the fishing operations and economics of the fishing community. And I'll dig into that in a little bit. Um, before I move on, I wanted to flag, you know, one key tool here that is, is really hot off the presses that we've been working, develop, working to develop over the last several years. And that is a tool to provide data back to our industry partners. Um, for the first 10 plus years of the study fleet program, um, it was very difficult for our industry partners who were collecting that data to see what they were collecting and have it available to them. Um, what you're looking at here is a screenshot from a tool called GoFish, or the Graphical Onboard Fishing Informatics Systems homepage. Um, just, just call it GoFish, <laughs> way too long of a name otherwise. Um, and what you're looking at is, is an interactive an interface, it's an interactive tool um, that we've deployed on just a small handful of our study fleet vessels as a pilot so far that allows them to interact with the data that they've collected through study fleet over time. So they can toggle on the different species if they wanna see what they caught where, they can zoom in and out on the map, they can add layers such as habitat types, they can bring in ocean currents and bottom temperature um, predictions, they can look at uh, the solar and the lunar cycles and the tidal cycles, which you probably all heard are associated with different catch rates. So again, this is um, a really new tool that we're working to develop to provide this information back um, ultimately to the fishermen who collected it. So still a work in progress, um, but I wanted to flag this as a really critical, really critical step for any cooperative research project. It's closing that loop, providing that information and that value back to the fishermen who are collecting the data. So moving on to our next category, ecosystem monitoring. I mentioned that this area of the Gulf of Maine is amongst the fastest warming in the entire world. Um, and it's really critical for us to understand what's going on, not just on the surface, which we can get from many of our satellites, but subsurface. Um, there's many of that dynamics and a whole of the species <laughs> that we're um, harvesting, of course, are, are living subsurface, not just on the surface of the ocean. And so in the early 2000s, the EMOLT program, or Environmental Monitors, Monitors on Lobster Traps and Large Trawlers program, was developed really to, to, to fill this, again, fill this data gap of um, what are, you know, what is the oceanographic climate and dynamics in the subsurface, particularly on the bottom, um, throughout the Northeast region. 
Um, and so this program has evolved quite a bit over the years. It started out with probes that would just get mailed to lobster fishermen, largely in the Gulf of Maine. They would put them on their traps, take them off after a year, and then mail them back. Um, now, in about 2015, we have transitioned to a real-time system. Where we're using Bluetooth temperature loggers. Um, where they're hauled back um, on the boat and the fishermen can see the bottom temperatures right on the screen uh, from their gear haul. So they then go up into this either by satellite, cell, or Wi-Fi um, to our databases where we can pull them for real-time ocean forecasting and hind casting. Um, so ultimately what we get from a program like this, one is, is this really incredible distribution. I want to point your attention to the, the map on the top right here, just showing you the real um, the power of really working with the industry and collecting environment, subsurface environmental data. This coverage is unheard of in any other research, um, in any other research setting where we usually have oceanographic vessels out maybe once every couple of years. Um, the other thing I wanted to flag is the plot here on the bottom right, which is just showing you the temperature cycle throughout the year. So if you're looking at um, um, the temperature cycle from May, um, all the way to April of the following year. And what you'll notice if you can squint at the colors there is that there's a, you can see the, the, the warming in the bottom waters in the Gulf of Maine in this plot. This is from one of our industry partners um, who has had their gear deployed in the same place for, for over a decade. Um, you can see there's been you know, almost a four degree Fahrenheit increase in the bottom temperatures in the area where this fisherman has deployed his gear. So again, getting that real tangible information on what are the what's the environment in the bottom waters and what does that mean ultimately for catches um, for this program we're providing input to oceanographic models both looking back in time and looking forward forecasting systems those are automatically pulled from our databases um, and then we've also worked to develop a covariate for the american lobster stock assessment basically using bottom temperature as an indicator of um, how good recruitment will be in a given year. Um, and in, in the case of lobster, um, the cooler it is, the better. And then finally, the direction we're moving with this program is expanding um, the types of parameters that we're monitoring. So right now, or, or historically, we've really been focused on bottom temperature. Um, but as the climate changes, we have more interactions from offshore, from the Gulf Stream, for example, which is a very strong and warm and salty current um, offshore here. Um, we really need more information about the salinity of the water as well as the oxygen and then pH um, as we start to think more about ocean acidification. So there's a lot of next steps for this program um, in terms of expanding the suite of, um, of envi environmental parameters that, that we're having industry collect. All right, the second to last example I'm going to give you here is on life history research. So there's, of course, industry are interacting with many, many fish on a daily basis. Um, that is not the case often in science where we rely largely on our surveys um, to collect biological samples. Unfortunately, those surveys often don't align when, with, when fish are spawning and sometimes they don't catch the fish we want. Um, and so the example I wanted to give here was a project focused on halibut. Um, halibut, in this case, Atlantic halibut, um, is a species that's not well sampled by our by surveys at all, but large, any of our surveys. Um, but and it's a species that we don't really know a lot about. Um, and so um, we developed this research program that provided fishermen with training um, to be able, as well as tools, which you can see in the bottom, the, center, the middle picture there, be able to collect um, biological samples from the halibut that they caught and they're bringing into cell. So we trained fishermen how to collect halibut otoliths, gonads, hearts, livers, spleen, all while they were out on their boats. Independently do that in the absence of a scientist on board. Um, of course, they were compensated for the time and effort that they put into this. And ultimately those data that we got from their biological sampling helps us identify geographic differences in halibut size and reproduction, maturity and growth rates, as well as spawning dynamics have been really critical in informing the halibut stock assessment. Um, we also um, trained fishermen to deploy satellite tags on halibut so we could better understand their movement and their spawning areas. And you can see a figure there on the bottom um, that demonstrates some of the um, of the of the movement trends in, in halibut that were documented through this effort. Some of the satellite tags were deployed independently by fishermen who were trained to tag um, halibut, and some of them were deployed during chartered um, during chartered days on, on commercial fishing vessels. 
So the last category I wanted to leave us on here is an area that I think is on many of our, our minds, especially here in the Northeast. Um, offshore wind is coming fast and furious, and we know very little about how it is going to impact um, our ocean ecosystems, our fisheries, and our fishing communities. And so we've initiated several new research projects in the last um, couple of years to un better understand how offshore wind will impact um, everything that we do in, in fishery science and um, in fishing operations. So the first component of this work is that we're using the study fleet data, which I mentioned earlier, that's collected by fishermen to understand what the economic impact will be upon on, on different fisheries. Um, so we have ramped up a tool that's at this point focused on one species on long fin squid, um, but we're currently actually advancing that for other species as well. The data from study fleet is very precise um, in terms of the location that fishing is occurring. That is not data that is largely available through other mandatory reporting. And so it's a really unique tool that we have and data set that we have to be able to start answering some of these questions and inform some of the compensation um, that will be occurring um, as offshore wind displaces fishing activity. So that is an active area of work for us. Um, the second is thinking really carefully about how we adapt our fishery surveys in the face of offshore wind. And so whether that's developing new mobile gear surveys where we need a tool to standardize it, we've been doing some research using a restrictor rope, which is what you can see there on the bottom, um, bottom left. Um, and that's to maintain a consistent a spread of bottom trawls. So as we move towards more industry-based multi-vessel surveys, using this as a tool to standardize the data to allow us to understand those changes over time. Um, we're also scoping the development of a new hook and line survey and partnering with the fishing fleet who have the expertise and how to deploy that gear and standardize that gear um, and design that survey. And we'll be piloting that hook and line survey in the spring of uh, 2024. So we are working furiously to get ready um, to initiate initiate that work as well. So ultimately, there are many ways that we can work with fishermen. Again, this is just scratching the surface, um, but there are but industry brings much value to every single stage in the scientific process, whether it's developing a research question, collecting that data, interpreting that data, developing new gear, or ultimate or informing management. Um, and I should certainly mention that here in the Northeast, and I'm sure across um, across the country, um, NOAA Fisheries is certainly not the only one who is doing this work. So I wanted to provide some um, credit to the many organizations who are contributing significantly to, the, to cooperative research in the Northeast region. And I won't go through all of them just to say that um, it's really, it really takes a lot of teamwork um, to, to do cooperative research. And NOAA Fisheries is, is certainly not the only one who's moving forward a lot of this work here in, in the Northeast region. Ultimately, what we're looking to do here is to find some balance, which is very difficult to do, um, but to balance you know, healthy ocean ecosystems that can continue to produce seafood, um, as well as vibrant fishing communities and food security for our nation, as well as for the world. And so in order to do this, um, we really have to work together. And I'm sure we'll hear more from Scott and, and Corey on how they have done that um, over on the other coast um, of the US. I think that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Um, I will stop sharing. I'm happy to take questions um, whenever folks are ready. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I'm not seeing any questions immediately. Um, so let's pass it over to Scott. Um, then we can take questions on all presentations at the end. Over to you, Scott. You should be able Great. to share your screen. Great, thank you, Allison, uh, very much. Let me share my screen real quick here. So you are seeing my presentation. Yes, yes, Great. there we go. Okay, thank you. So th thank you, Anna, for a, a really um, interesting presentation and a really great description of the challenges and the successes and the kind of the context behind cooperative research. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, um, Allison, for my intro there. Um, one of my highlights is being on out with fishermen. Um, most of what I do is in uh, meetings these days and trying to coordinate and manage different approaches to research. But I've spent about a year in the Bering Sea um, over a number of years, and that's been um, a, a really deep 
and uh, interesting and cool learning experience for me. Um, I haven't really done that in the context of going out and getting uh, fish. I've done that in the context of surveys, some of our cooperative survey work, which has been um, ongoing since about 2005. But my my summary and presentation here will, will um, be similar to what what Anna uh, presented in different in a couple of ways. I'll drill into a little bit of the context behind the reality for Bering Sea crab stocks right now. Um, and kind of shared in my opening image here of some of the changes in the environment. These are both pictures of the Bering Sea um, in, in the backdrop here. So BSFRF has been around since about 2003. And to just give a very high level flyover of a number of the industry folks who have been closely involved either since the beginning or are currently on our board. Um, we have active fishermen from some of the crab vessels and the companies that are involved in Bering Sea Crab. The stakeholder group includes some of our primary processors and we meet um, with this active group of folks at least once a month, sometimes more frequently, depending on the circumstances. And currently we have a group of um, advisors. So I'm the executive director. We have a couple of um, deep deep uh, knowledge pools here to go to um, Dr. Stoffer, Dr. Cruz, and Dr. Lower. And then Madison works for me. Um, she's currently pursuing her PhD in crab assessment modeling on Baird Itaner crab at the University of Washington. An overview. Um, Without going too deep here into crab world in the Bering Sea and what we do with our um, supportive group and our collaborators is try to um, update and present our priority list of what we're focusing on. And I've pulled this slide forward. This is one that we frequently use. Um, and we're in that we're in the midst of these updates right now. It's kind of the key time for crab. Uh, science and management decisions here as we get close to the fall. Um, but but really with something that's continuing to rise on the radar is climate ecosystem crab research and all of the other things that we've prioritized over time um, sort of have this ecosystem level functionality in the background, um, of course, very much driven by temperature and any other changes in the physical or chemical oceanography that are tied to temperature. Um, but climate and ecosystem crab research is rising on the radar here. I wanted to, to um, give a little bit of an idea about that, and I'll touch base on it in a minute here, too, about some of the ecosystem indicator efforts. Um, we heard one of our NOAA research collaborating partners present on this this last week a couple of times. So the current crab context, I threw a couple of these in here um, for folks that may not know. Um, right now is a crisis time for Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands crab stocks. So the big one that most people know about is Bristol Bay Red King crab. This is the big bodied high value crab and it's been closed for two seasons, which has been the first time for that since 1994 and 1995. We're expecting um, soon here that it will be officially announced that it will be likely open for a small season this coming fall. So that's a little glimmer of hope, good news for us. It's not going to be a large season and it's not officially declared to be open yet. The big one that has um, sort of been the bread and butter for Bering Sea crab industry over the last several decades has been is snow crab, which is Kynocetes apelio. And this stock experienced its first ever season closure last year. So the 2022 and 2023 season was closed. And the reality for us right now with this continuing crisis is that the second closure is very likely. The other shelf stocks, um, they're split into two for what's called Tanner Crab or kind of see these Baird Eye West and East around a line in the Bering Sea and also St. Matthew Blue King Crab. So these are generally lesser um, volume stocks. Tanner Crab, the Baird Eye can become uh, punctuated and rise up in its volume on occasion, as you see in the 14, 15 and 15, 16 period. But these stocks are, are really cyclic. They go through um, boom and bust here and they experience frequent season closures. So I just wanted to bring that forward. 
to give a little bit of reality here for um, where the Bering Sea crab industry as a whole, which includes this industry supported research foundation has been over the last couple of cycles and, and where we're going um, now and probably the, the next two or three years in the, in the future as well. Um, this crisis is a reality for us. Um, this last week, we finished off the crab plan team week, which we um, hold a close participation in. That's one of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council bodies, which reviews the collaborative summaries from uh, the state agency and the NOAA folks, and then others as well about what the status of each of the stocks are. At the end of that week, um, we have uh, co-hosted an event with the uh, trade association that Corey works for, Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers, for a number of years now. So we, at the end of September, at the end of CPT week, we do the, uh, a crab science symposium. And this one was called Charting a Course Through the Bering Sea Crab Crisis. So kind of a continued um, level of awareness about what's up and how to continue to try and do research that would help uh, with some further understanding on the reality of the stocks and potentially help with some management out, outcomes and options here. The reality right now is these are fisheries that are closed. The economic crisis is real. Um, there are people leaving the fishery. There are people experiencing very, very dire times um, and that's continuing. So it's an important part of our context for research consideration. We know science goes slow. Um, we know that we're trying to expedite that feed and, and increase that um, amount that feeds into management. And then further, we also know that climate and ecosystem change is very complex, complex and it's difficult to understand how it relates in a number of ways to some of the other pieces. Um, part of what we participate in here as we go, and especially as we've um, become a little bit more grounded and finished up some of our longer standing research, is what research priorities we um, can help with and focus on and, and, and work collaboratively on. Um, this is a list of kind of the top 10 from the North Pacific Council over the last three year slot. Um, and you would note really that there's a, a number of these green arrow things I presented on this recently that are specific to crab and how we can do um, important help there on a number of fronts. But this one that I've put a red box around is um, a new and growing one, which is really kind of the only um, explicit content here that is looking closely at what some of the changes, um, of course, related to climate here are beginning to impact more and more as we get um, into a changing ecosystem in the Bering Sea. These are going to be developed, redeveloped, and reassessed and, and reevaluated here in short order. Um, they are due for an update here and I expect that um, climate and some more clear connections to how crab and climate research could be conducted will be um, appearing on the updated list. I just wanted to bring that forward for folks. And part of what I wanted to do here now is to just dump, jump into um, a little bit of where some of our um, areas of focus as a cooperative research group, specifically for crab in the Bering Sea, try to drill down into. And then as I've noted here with this slide, um, you know, what is going on with climate impacts and how do we adjust our focus on the project's specifics? Um, and it, can we even do that? And then how does it tie together with um, trying to be able to monitor or see the changes in the environment? Um, and I gave a great overview on a number of things here about getting feedback with stakeholders and working with the fishermen and kind of looking to them for a lot of expertise on um, how to go conduct things. It's never a great idea for a bunch of scientists to plan a, a cooperative research project and then go out and have the fishermen tell them um, the right way to do it. So part of our strength, I think, over time has been to work closely with fishermen get their feedback all the way through all pieces of the process, um, including which vessels to use, which gear to use, um, the places where they really have their strengths. Um, and we would rely on some of the scientific research strengths with the um, 
with the NOAA and the other agency folks that they are the ones who know how to do the statistics, of course, and the planning on the methods. But basically to blend those strengths, put them together, and especially in the context of a difficult issue like climate change and the associated impacts, to bring all of the strengths together to make sure that the research we're doing is sound and helpful. So in that context, I wanted to highlight here um, a new area <clears throat> that we worked closely with the federal partners at NOAA and the state of Alaska at Alaska Department of Fish and Game, both of which came together early this year in a very, very expedited process to complete what we call our, our first collaborative pot sampling project, which is CPS-1. And we're um, planning the next one of those, which we would expect to be about six months out right now. But we, um, this was an a important project that built on being able to communicate well with the industry um, and get a couple of boats that were lined up to charter, specifically to go out and do a new survey um, that was related to kind of a first glimpse at what many folks in the industry and the management context were looking to be a better idea of what we what we are characterizing as a winter survey. It happened a little bit later um, than we had initially intended. So it's a winter spring survey in the in the timing of a March April period in the Bering Sea. Corey was out on this. Um, there were two fishing boats. Um, Corey took some great pictures here, but this was this is a kind of a, our most recent example of a really strong. Um, effort. There was a number of different ways that this one could have fallen on its face or or, or failed um, in doing anything as far as science in the Bering Sea in March, April period is pretty tough. Um, I won't drill into too many of the details here, but this one was kind of in direct response to a few things that were um, coming out of the status of these crab stocks with some uh, upcoming closures being faced by the industry and what sorts of issues we would need new information for. So there was a request to investigate, are the current closure areas adequate or should they be closed to be more um, exclusive closures that covered all fishing gears? The council's response was they needed uh, more information and a better set of information seasonally to show what was going on with crab under the current conditions. So our group, ESFRF, in collaboration, as I noted, with our partners, um, came up with a plan and the agencies funded this. So this would have been typically under more normal times, something that BSFRF could have funded. But given the situation with um, a decrease, a substantial decrease in revenues for directly to the, the fleets and subsequently for research that we would receive, both NIMS and AFSC funded this one almost exclusively. Um, there's an ongoing review of this that is um, related to upcoming council activity. And we expect that this project is likely related to an ongoing monitoring survey that we, we will um, continue to help with. A couple of the quick context pieces here. Um, Anna noted the extreme changes that some of the remote areas uh, on the coastlines that are high use and high value areas for commercial fisheries um, are experiencing the warming trends and seeing some of the impacts of what's a changing ecosystem. The Bering Sea is definitely seeing some of that. And this slide just gives an idea of some of the existing boundaries. These are long standing boundaries of, around districts, um, around closure areas, and they show the CPS 1 ex survey extent target area. So in this area, this is uh, inner Bristol Bay, just north of the Alaska Peninsula. Um, on the Bering Sea shelf inside of the 100 meter bathy, which is shown on this figure. The red box with the pink bottom, that's a closure area to generally set up to protect red king crab and keep mobile gear off the bottom out of that box. And our green boundary was what we um, came up with was a winter spring distribution area that we would try to cover for a, um, what's going on in this area, this area at this time with a um, pot sampling effort. So this, it is a very high level and quick summary. Um, these two boats had science folks on board. They had industry folks, folks on board working together in science teams to collect a, a suite of information um, across almost 700 stations um, with pots that were set about a quarter of a mile apart over 11 transects. Um, the transects were about 15 nautical miles apart. So you get an idea that this is a pretty large area 
um, and we're zooming into one small piece of it here, really, even with a big survey like this. Um, the Silver Spray and Summer Bay were the two vessel industry vessels, both well-known crabbers in the Bering Sea um, to conduct this work. And our high, high level results are that we caught about 10,000 crab. One of these notes is that we had a sex ratio skew that there was quite a bit more males than females here, um, which is a mismatch for the longest standing data uh, source, which is the NOAA Summer Survey. And I'll touch on that in a minute here. So we documented a number of things here during this work that were related to physical attributes as well as bio biological information, the water temperature, the overall crab distribution during this period was the main target. Um, our biology covered size and sex and shell condition um, in some indices of female maturity and including egg clutch fullness in the development stage of any eggs. And then a very important objective for us on this one also, which was part of this survey, was to try and be able to document movement and to come up with a way of linking some of our known distributions of these commercial crab stocks and specifically Bristol Bay Red King crab with pop-up satellite eggs. So a pretty important and strong focus, of course, for crab is what's going on with the bottom. And the physical attribute here of bottom temperatures we know is related and driving force here for a number of different processes that um, reflect where crab are and where they like to be, where they're going to find their food, where they're going to reproduce, um, where the different life stages hang out. Um, temperature is very likely related to habitat, which we're trying to crack the, the shell on a little bit more to understand some of those linkages. But one of the things that we look at each year, especially from the NOAA Summer Survey Trawl, which covers this whole area and is depicted in this color chart, is what's going on with the bottom temperatures. And you would no note one thing if you're familiar with this area is there's a, a cold water intrusion down onto the Bering Sea Shelf, which is called the cold pool. And there has been some recent general absence of the cold pool in recent years. But this is a quick summary that shows um, the, the information that comes directly from the NOAA survey each summer, um, just about this time. This one's out from very early September, and it shows the most recent depiction of this cold pool, which is sort of a, um, a split and remnant, not as cold as some in the past, but not as warm as some of the more recent ones. This slide came from um, one of our collaborators that presented at our science symposium last week. And of course, there's a way of modeling what can go on with the cold pool and also comparing that with the observed cold pool. Um, this slide shows you the observations on the left side per year and those that can be modeled on the right hand, um, some matching, some differences, but you get an idea of where this, where this cold pool is. And especially in this 15, 16, and 18, 19 period, there's a diminishing um, presence of this cold pool as observed. The bottom temperature is very important. And one of our, one of our uh, summary pieces here for this recent collaborative pot sampling work was to come up with a way of understanding what, are, what we see on this uh, winter spring distribution. How does that fit or does it fit with um, depictions that come from the NOAA Summer Survey. So this plot shows the 2022 NOAA Survey and, and uh, mature male crab distribution with temperature underlying on the upper left panel. On the upper right is the one that came from the NIFS 2023 Summer Survey, which just finished a couple months, uh, yeah, a couple months back, month and a half back. And then our survey, which is on this bottom larger blown up chart, is the one from the March-April period. So our survey occurs between these other two surveys and one piece of course to be very interested in is to just understand is there a difference in the distribution is there a difference in the temperature regime is there some apparent change in the where um, the winter expected temperatures would align with the distribution or just the um, variance in temperature from season but this is one of our key pieces of information I'm showing these two things here as a depiction of mature male red king crab on this one and mature female red king crab on this one. The context for management and some of the decisions whether to open or close these fisheries can be dependent on both um, the mature male and female together. In this case, for this stock, 
it's mature females that have kept the fishery closed for the last two seasons. And it's apparent to us at this point that the mature females, which were captured during this survey in the summer of 2023, which um, importantly note this large bubble here on the upper right panel, um, have pushed this stock to exceed the threshold. So hopefully it will be opened um, officially here based on an announcement soon. The satellite tagging was, as I noted, an important part of this work. I have a few slides to just quickly cover um, this part. Again, this was um, a, an important piece of the cooperative work, um, working on, you know, does it make sense uh, on an engineering basis to try and attach one of these tags to a big crab? How does it affect the crab movement? Um, getting feedback from folks. So we know through some of our work that it, that it does work. These satellite tags are designated um, pre-recorded devices that monitor temperature um, and the locations that they're at. Crab don't move quick enough in relative terms to fish to really be um, as useful as the application of, of these same devices to some of the fish stocks that move more, more and qu more quickly. Um, but what we do get is the ability to program these tags for release so the crab tag comes off of the crab, floats to the surface because it's buoyant and has an antenna that it transmits its um, locational and temperature data. And once that's received, we get a vector from start to finish about where the crab was tagged and where this, where this tag was recovered. Um, very briefly, the two bottom panels show during our CPS1, the March-April survey, the yellow dots are shown showing where we put tags out. So we were able un, under this case to um, put individual tags out broadly and then come back and place more tags at some of the higher density centers of where we caught crab. And the panel on the right um, has two things. One, the green dots show where these tags all popped up um, so we can compute a vector from start to finish. And then the, the colored boxes are the density of the summer survey, which occurred almost simultaneously to when these pop-ups occurred. So just drilling in a little bit more, when you look into where these ones were tagged and where they came up, it kind of looks a little bit difficult to interpret with a little bit of homework. And I'm just quickly covering this before a last couple of slides that you do a little homework and you can see that there is some directionality to this movement um, during this winter spring period when we're trying to pay attention to what the temperatures may be um, sharing for the first time on a winter spring distribution of Red King crab. Um, this work is part of a continuance. There's an expected uh, connectivity to the next summer survey or two. Um, there were tags put out by NOAA, uh, by some of our collaborators, Dr. Zacker in Kodiak, um, was able to place 75 female tags and 40, female, 40 male tags out, um, as is shown in these two figures. So that's a little bit of a drill into um, some of our most recent cooperative research, which has focused on um, new survey approaches and methods and some tagging and movement work after some of our longstanding um, trawl specific survey work, which has gone on for more than 10 years. Um, I'll finish with a brief, quick summary of kind of where we are and where we're trying to communicate what's next, um, what's on the horizon. We're working on um, different ideas to sampling, including pots, cameras, um, likely trawls, different types of tagging, um, coordinating closely with our state and federal partners. And one of the key things here for cooperative and collaborative work is that we have an industry that is struggling. Um, these boats are tied up and they are generally not a very diverse fleet. So anything that we can do to charter these folks and um, get them out on the water uh, in a mode to either be a researcher or fisherman or both at the same time, that's what we're looking for and that's what we're working on. Um, we're firming up our research plans and our research projects kind of as we speak, um, working closely with industry. Corey's up in Kodiak as part of that, um, working closely with industry. And as a bottom line here, um, the climate impacts are really difficult, of course, to understand. Even when we've got lots of data, um, it's difficult to understand the connectivity to the stocks directly. So drawing more attention to that and understanding how it's related is very important for us. So that's kind of where I'm uh, at as a landing point and 
Corey has been very importantly involved as an advisor to the BSFRF, um, working within the trade association, which is Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers. So Corey, I will go ahead and turn it over to you to share a little bit about um, talking with skippers and getting that information shared. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, just looking at the clock here, um, we're coming up on uh, 11 o'clock Alaska time, top of the hour. Um, so I'll keep this very brief because I would love to for there to be time for folks to ask questions. Um, Dr. Mercer gave a really great presentation and, and so did you, Scott. Thank you for those. Um, and so I'm going to kind of just piggyback off of that um, here with, um, with some of what I wanted to talk about. And, you know, climate and cooperative research is a really broad topic, um, as we've heard from the, the previous two presentations. And so um, with the few minutes that I have here, I just kind of want to narrow in and bring some focus to two, uh, maybe one of the small projects that, that we're working on um, here with the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers. Um, so the, the two projects um, that, that we're, we're kind of piloting right now is, is uh, first is a skipper survey. Now this is a different survey from the, the surveys that Dr. Mercer and Scott were talking about. This is um, a questionnaire or a, a poll type of survey. Um, and then one that I'm not really gonna touch on today, but something that we're very uh, passionate about is some collaborative work to collect environmental data um, that's, that's fishery dependent. So, um, so putting um, environmental sensors um, temperature loggers and such on our um, crab pots while they're deployed in the fishery. Um, so turning back to the skipper survey that we're doing, this is something kind of a, a first off effort here in Alaska to gather, collect fishermen's observations from the fishing season and translate that into a format that's useful for management. So what we've done is we've piloted a number of um, specific questions and, and now our, our questionnaire or this, this survey has been vetted through um, our management council's science body. So the crab plan team that advises the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, and then also their scientific and statistical committee. Um, so we've done an, uh, iterations of this, of this survey through those science bodies to really hone in on what's gonna be informational um, and useful for, for managers, but also asking a suite of questions that fishermen will be able to, um, to answer at the end of each fishing season. And so typically uh, these questionnaires, um, there's, there's about seven questions that remain static. So the same question every single season, and it's just comparing the current season to the previous season. And so the, the idea is that eventually you, you form a baseline um, of these observations over time. And granted, you can go back into um, skipper logbooks and see um, kind of location where they're fishing, their catch per unit effort, which is a really good indicator. Um, but the suite of questions that we're asking really dials in on kind of the status of the fishery that year compared to the last. And when you stack those questions up season after season after season, you can start to pick it apart and really see, notice trends and patterns. Um, and so, you know, again, Dr. Mercer really touched on um, the importance of trust and transparency when working with um, scientists and managers, but also fishermen. And so this has to be a very transparent process. You have to be able to build that trust between the fishermen, scientists, and the fisheries managers. Um, and so this is something that we've been working hard at here at Alaska Marine Sea Crabbers um, to build those relationships and then have this avenue for that fishery dependent observation and data to get tied right into um, crab management. And so as an example, our skipper surveys at the end of each season, um, we'll collect the, the, the data, we'll collate it, and then we provide it to, um, we have a ecosystem or sorry, uh, ecosystem and socioeconomic profile. And that's like a status report. And part of that feeds into the management, but they're, seeking community in, engagement and um, stakeholder and fisherman input. And so it's a very small track, but 
but something um, very real that that this fisherman observations and data can can get tied directly into the management of of the stocks that they're fishing. So we have two active um, poles out with crab right now, and and we're hoping that that can pilot kind of a a roadmap or a program for uh, to expand into other fisheries um, if if folks want to take it that way. Um, so I'll end there. Um, I'd love to hand it back to Allison and see if there are any questions um, for any of the panelists here. Um, but I'll turn it back to you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. And thank you to Anna and Scott as well. Those are fantastic presentations full of lots of great information. Um, Sydney, uh, if you could please stop the recording.